up a little bit um, and say that we're moving into the third and final uh, theme of the symposium, which is focused really on, on kind of legal education um, and, and slightly bigger picture. And so I think you guys are going to ease us into it, and then the panels that follow um, are going to get deeper into it. Um, and the focus of this panel was initially kind of legal technology and torts. I think we've moved on to thinking about liability a little bit more broadly. Um, but I'll let Dazza Greenwood take it from here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Robert. Thanks for putting this awesome conference together. So this, this panel is intended to open a discussion, um, and we very much want it to be a discussion with you all in the room. I know some of you, not all of you, and uh, I think you have actually a lot to contribute, so we hope to make this quite interactive after we... Uh, do some table setting with some remarks, and so please be thinking about your questions or your ideas and contribute them. Um, so just to say a, a couple of things at a high level, you know automation's been big for a while, obviously. Um, so we're seeing a lot more automated processes. Um, it's changing the economy, it's changing the workforce, it's changing our daily lives, um, being able to automate the boring stuff. Um, and to achieve better outcomes more quickly. But there's a sort of a subset, it's one way to look at it, of automation, which we would call an autonomous system, and where the system itself is, has some almost like agency um, to be able to perceive um, something in the environment, process according to some sort of rule set, and um, take an action, sort of determine something and do something, and when and the word autonomous connotes that that action um, could be official, could be like the actual binding enforceable thing from a legal perspective, and yet occur without human review or approval. Well, that's interesting. And you know, what comes to mind are things, just to make this a little less mysterious before we make it a little more mysterious, before we make it less mysterious, um, is, um, Think automated trading systems. So everybody, excuse me, um, high frequency trading um, trade systems. So people, have, who has never heard of high frequency trading system? Who has heard of high frequency trading system? Just quick show of hands. Thank you. Um, that's a really good example of, in its own narrow scope, in a, a kind of an autonomous system, which will conduct transactions and which absolutely they are enforceable and binding and they happen so quickly a human wouldn't even be capable of review and approval of those of those um, transactions um, if you look to other things like um, in air traffic control is another good example where a lot's happening without individual um, control and then right on our panel we've got two good examples with autonomous vehicles which are now starting to become very real and with distributed autonomous organizations, blockchain-based new creatures on the Serengeti of the economy and society. So um, these raise unique legal questions and issues and also possibilities and opportunities. Um, and so we want to engage today on one facet of it, not so much the property or the contract or agency, but tort, the most entertaining panel topic of them all. Um, and so um, we'll be talking a little bit about the, um, the potential for autonomous systems to, one way or another, cause, you know, proximally a um, tort and a, a harm that could be conceived of as a tort, and then um, starting to grapple with um, questions about what are the role, what are the legal roles that would apply here, um, who would be a plaintiff and who would be a defendant and who would be a witness, or what would be a plaintiff and what would be a defendant and what would be a witness? And, um, is there, what is the legal entity status of a system like this today? Not so much, um, you know, it's, but there's interesting things happening that I think Primavera in particular will be able to educate us about with the emergence of legal personality for some autonomous systems. Is that the, what, what capabilities would that provide? And would that help us solve the legal puzzle in a way where we could have more predictable legal results 
and where it can be engineered in a way that really works well. We shall find out next on the Autonomous Systems Panel. So to get us started, um, I want to um, first um, introduce or ask Brian if you'd kindly introduce himself and thank you for coming out from Stanford. And um, um, if you could uh, say a few words about yourself and then maybe um, do me the favor of passing it to Primavera where you can introduce yourself and then let's get right into the dialogue. Okay, go. That sounds great. So, uh, is this mic working? I'm not getting a green. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I'm Brian Casey. Uh, I am a lecturer at Stanford Law School, uh, and I'm also uh, a fellow at the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford, uh, where we get a bunch of cars, supermodel with self-driving equipment, uh, and go and test out these kinds of hypotheses on the racetrack. Uh, so really excited to be here and talk about this. And uh, I'm Primavera, I'm a researcher at the CNRS in Paris, and I'm faculty associate at the Bergman Center here at Harvard. And um, yeah, my research is more on the uh, blockchain side of things. Um, so I'm a legal researcher, and um, I'm looking at what are the legal implications of uh, autonomous system, where autonomy is more with regard to the operational autonomy, as opposed to the decisional autonomy that is more related to AI. Beautiful. Um, thank you. So I, I want to kick us off by asking um, a question which I think plays out very differently in the autonomous vehicles versus the distributed autonomous organization space. But it's the role of, at a high level, I call it transparency. Um, um, and how does that play out in the autonomous vehicle context? Well, on one end of the spectrum, like how about black box? Um, like I think the name says it all, but um, you know, like that little that little um, logging file um, that exists, which is in some ways not that transparent, but which can be opened. Um, it's very secure. It's supposed to be immutable. Um, but in, in, in the distributed autonomous organizations, very especially the ones on open and public blockchains, they really prize things that are. Um, from birth all the way through their life cycle, very visible, very accessible, very auditable um, by everybody. But what is the role of these um, black box systems um, in, in ascertaining um, and then also, um, let's say, if deciding liability when a tort maker actually just realized I did a bad thing? Um, the first thing we should do is actually talk about how could a tort occur with an autonomous system, and then I want to ask about black boxes, but could you each talk a little bit about a scenario you could imagine, or like a legal fact pattern or a use case or something like that, where there could be liability resulting from an autonomous system? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I steal your mic? Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, I can speak uh, with real world examples because we've actually seen a few. Um, so. Uh, in in San Francisco, uh, about a year and a half ago, we ha saw the first robot accused of negligence. Um, it was a black box system, uh, which refers to uh, uh, usually a deep uh, learning system, usually a neural network, uh, that whose decision-making complexity is sufficient that you can't understand the exact specific rule set that applies to uh, uh, how it is governed. Um, we saw a we saw a vehicle collide with a motorcyclist. Uh, the motorcyclist fell over and injured his shoulder. Uh, so we're not in the world of uh, commercial or economic loss limitations. We're in the world of actual physical injury caused by a software system. Uh, and the police came and looked at the uh, vehicle's data, data event recorder and blamed the accident on the motorcyclist. Um, We've also seen a series of black box systems uh, cause injury in much more simplistic contexts. Um, uh, the Toyota sudden acceleration lawsuits are a now famous example of this. Um, you have acceleration software that controls the speed of a vehicle um, going haywire, so to speak. Um, the vehicles begin accelerating. The passengers are unable to apply the brakes, uh, and it results in an accident. Um, when there was litigation that ensued, um, Toyota and the plaintiffs went through the source code of this acceleration software line by line, looking for a defect uh, that you try to see in the traditional sense, um, and they couldn't find any. Uh, but nonetheless, using inference-based 
res ipsa style regimes uh, to go into the tort weeds a little bit. Um, they were able to f they were able to uh, assign blame to Toyota regardless. Uh, so we actually have seen black box systems cause injury, tortious style injury. Um, it has departed from the usual software paradigm of being able to point to a specific defect in software. Um, and we've nevertheless been able to pretty successfully assign liability in these instances. And this is obviously just the tip of the iceberg uh, once we enter into a world where software is making more decisions that have potential physical uh, implications for injury, uh, then we're just going to see these kinds of lawsuits proliferate. And actually, since I hope you're yeah, speaking let's... the mic not working, I'm not sure how to turn it on. <laughs> um, so we're great with mics and technology land here. Right. Um, <laughs> but, um, I was just going to say, could you just um, again introduce yourself because your mic wasn't on before. Oh. Because Stanford and everything's good. The Stanford and everything's good. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, I am a lecturer at Stanford Law School. I teach uh, some technology law courses there. And I'm a fellow uh, at the Center for Automotive Research where um, a bunch of automotive industry affiliates give Stanford a ton of resources to actually deploy self-driving cars. Uh, and PhD students and professors there uh, build research questions into these systems and actually test them on the racetrack, which is pretty exciting stuff. Great, thank you. Uh, Prima Vera, could you help us understand in the space maybe explain a little bit about what distributed autonomous entities are, but how, how have you been thinking about and what, what are examples maybe of how torts could be relevant to DAOs? Yeah, um, well luckily there are not yet any DAOs that are really controlling any physical system, so there is less risk of like injury-like things. Um, so I guess like most of the liability would refer to like financial uh, thoughts. Uh, now the difference is that because the system are actually highly transparent indeed um, and predeterministic, so there is no possible intentionality or there is no possible decision that will be made by the system. So the, um, the problems that have been encountered so far is more, well, either it's people actually using uh, the system in order to achieve like uh, illegal activity, money laundering and so forth, but, um, but you also have systems that are actually designed to be uh, or to carry on an activity that might not be legal in a particular jurisdiction. Um, for instance, like gambling or uh, the, the more far-fetched assassination market and things like this where you actually have, but you, you really have like a person that is designing it with the purpose of uh, achieving um, a particular activity. And then we also have had uh, a few instances in which those, uh, those, this software has been deployed on the blockchain and even though it was transparent and even though people could audit and uh, pretty much could have known uh, the, pos the potential implication of interacting with those systems um, because it's still a very experimental technology and because it's actually quite difficult to analyze the code and think of all the possible ways in which the code could be exploited. There has been some instance in which, uh, for instance, uh, uh, someone managed to exploit a particular vulnerability in the code of those uh, distributed system in order to take money out of the system. Um, alternately, there has, been, there has been cases in which uh, uh, someone, again, exploited a vulnerability and then completely froze the funds into the system. So, again, the question is, it's not the system itself that has done the thought, it's always a third party, but we don't have, because, because the funds are actually completely governed by this technological infrastructure, there is no way of uh, intervening or uh, seizing back those funds or liberating those funds without having an actual um, network-wide coordination in order to, to remediate that thought. So that's a, that's a very different type of, uh, of uh, possible liability that can emerge from those two different types of uh, autonomy. Thank you. That was, I'm glad I asked. That was very illuminating, I have to say. I hadn't been thinking about it that way. But that, what you just said, Primavera, made me realize in a tort context, which, as you've noted, is significant in a sense off to the side from a lot of the commercial law. 
um, uh, overlay that we think about with distributed autonomous engines in that context. <laughs> when you have a DAO that arguably, a DAO distributed autonomous organization, this is, a, uh, this is the context, that is, you know, um, let's say in some normative way, been the proximal cause of harm that otherwise might be a tort, it raised the question about the legal party that to have a duty, one must be a legal party. Like my toaster has no duty not to burn my toast. Um, and so um, the parties with the duty might be the individuals behind the DAO or benefiting from it or investing in it. But the DAO, as exactly as you say, was, um, was designed and operated to take actions without their input, it, 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 it's out of their control. And so in tort, as I vaguely remember from like the mid nineties, there was, um, there you got duty, you have breach, you have harm. So the party with the duty and the entity, like a DAO that committed the breach may not be the same. And therefore we may not even have the components of a cause of action that would sound in tort. Um, by that analysis. Yeah, yeah, I think the distinction between like AI based system or autonomous system because of AI as opposed to autonomous system uh, with the blockchain is that the blockchain actually is extremely predeterministic and cannot actually breach the chain of causality. It's actually just everything just flows from the rules that have been deployed on the blockchain. Uh, as opposed to uh, an autonomous system, and I think that's where interesting thought question arise is when you have a system that has been designed in a particular manner but is also designed to learn and then the, the, the developer that has actually uh, created the system cannot foresee the way in which the system will evolve and what are the decisions that the system will take. Whereas in a blockchain based system, the person that is developing the software actually have exactly like, well, of course, mistakes are made, but the, the, the person that is actually developing and deploying the software on the blockchain has a perfect foreseeability of how the system will work. And in that case, it's easier in, that, in, in this sense to impute the responsibility to the person that is developing the software or to the person that are transacting with the software in a particular manner, as opposed to in the case of, a, of an AI-based system where there might be an argument that there is a point in which the chain of causality breaks, and therefore, where should the liability be imputed? Well, let's go. Let's swap, let's keep on this chain. I think um, so. Um, starting with you, Brian, um, Grimmer raises um, a critical kind of a dimension of doing a legal analysis, which is understanding who are the parties, what are their roles. And you're talking about the developer and the operators, or the participants in the market. What are the legal roles of all the parties involved in the relationships? And from there, we can we should have enough ingredients to begin to look at what are the rights and obligations of the people once we can name their legal roles within a scenario. Yeah. So um, let's do this both for autonomous vehicles and then let's do it for distributed autonomous organizations. And then uh, once we have the ingredients, let's get cooking on some, some tort scenarios. But yeah. who, what are the roles and the legal um, relationships in an autonomous vehicle. We have to, it looks like some kind of manufacturer, maybe what, like a, someone that sold it could be different, a distributor, we've got the operators. We have, what, what else do we have? We've got people that are you know, maybe victims or something. Yeah. We've got people who maintain and do aftermarket stuff, but add a module. Yeah. We have passengers. What, what are, how do you, in, in the um, Cars Institute, um, which is a center for Autom automated automotive research. Automotive research at Stanford. <laughs> cars, best acronym ever. Um, <laughs> how at cars do you do you conceive of the legal roles of all the parties for auto auto autonomous vehicles? Yeah. So uh, I think the the previous dialogue raises a, a really important distinction that I think we're going to see a lot of tension with in the future. So I tend to think of the harm, and then I work backwards from there to figure out what kind of legal analysis is going to govern it. If it's totally economic or financial harm, right now, TOR law has a very well-established doctrine of carving that off and moving it into the contract realm. Uh, so in if financial um, harms are caused in a distributed autonomous system, I think a lot of that is going to be governed by the terms of use of the system that... Uh, 
uh, g whatever the given system happens to be, uh, it's going to be in one way or another governed by the contract, the contractual relationship between the parties that entered into those transactions. Um, and it might be governed under implied warrant of merchantability uh, in a big way. And there might be a new sort of rise of that um, that doctrine in a world where software systems are engaging in more, are, are these sort of autonomous system engaging in more and more activity that can have um, non-physical harms. Um, then if you're talking about an automated system that ends up physically harming someone, we are very much in, in tort land. Um, and, uh, and then the way that you kind of think about the responsible parties uh, has been very confused in this space, I think. Um, the, uh, the SAE has put out these famous uh, five levels of autonomy uh, in the context of automated vehicles. Um, they are extremely confusing. No one knows whether it's level three or level four. When things are finally autonomous, everyone says we'll never get to level five. Um, the reality is that um, there are just the, the legal system is going to do this analysis in 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 a very straightforward way. Uh, a system is either closed loop or open loop. Uh, it is a very, very simple way of understanding it. Uh, and you can be in any level of the autonomous stack uh, and have a completely closed loop system. So level two is the area where the, an autonomous system can control the speed of a system. So if you think of a platooning truck fleet, um, level two systems would be where there's a driver in the front seat, they're controlling all of the steering, but there's some software system that's controlling the acceleration. Um, if that software system starts suddenly accelerating and takes off, it doesn't matter if the system is functionally level two or level three or level four. If there's no possibility for human intervention at the relevant juncture of the event, then the liability is going to shift back to the manufacturer of the system. Uh, if there is possibility, if there is a possibility for human intervention, then the system will be considered open, and the liability will fall on the human to intervene. And then, in the Tesla kind of situation, there will be contests over whether the system was in fact closed or open. So, a plaintiff will say. Uh, Tesla put this expectation on me to intervene in the event of an accident, but it was an unreasonable expectation. There's actually no way I could have intervened. And study after study shows that humans tend to um, over-rely on these systems, so they should have not implemented the system in that way. But once that question is decided, then it's just a closed open loop, open loop analysis. So the levels of autonomy, incredibly confusing. Closed versus open, incredibly simple. Um, so. That's a, uh, so okay, so then to the question of this big downstream effect uh, in a world where you're looking at closed and open loop systems for the event of an accident, well then everyone else in the supply chain is governed by contract law. Uh, the same contract law that, um, that we were talking about in the distributed autonomous context. So a manufacturer is gonna be in a contractual relationship with the downstream suppliers. Um, uh, with certain guarantees around the performance of their system, just as automotive make makers are today. Uh, and if, the, if a given component screws up uh, in a long supply chain stack, then automotive ma manufacturers are ultimately the point that the plaintiff ends up suing, but through joint and several liability, uh, the automotive uh, makers are able to tie downstream suppliers into the lawsuit and hold them liable for it. So there's like this front-facing entity uh, of an autonomous system where the question is going to be totally closed or open loop. Um, and then everything down the contract chain is going to be governed in ways very similar to the autonomous, uh, the distributed autonomous system regime that was just described. Perfect. So just to do a quick extraction from what you said. Yeah. Um, so first of all, that was helpful um, to provide the overall context of levels of autonomy and, and the distinction of open and closed loop. But to the question, um, Sorry. The, and it's okay, but I think you, you had it, I just want to um, extract. Um, there is the manufacturer, which ends up being the critical party as a defendant in when it's, we have a closed loop system because they were the last point in the causality chain where anyone could have an effect on what it was going to do. Yes. Um, and the other part, so then it's presumably in torts, we have always got plaintiffs, so we've got a plaintiff who's a the party, the party that was harmed. Yeah. And is there, and in an open loop system, what, oh, I'm sorry, and also a closed loop, you also have basically like the, the manufacturer can maybe do a cross claim to other folks that were involved. 
um, so, but we'll, we'll keep that all sounding in manufacturer product liability. Yes. Uh, there, when we open it, um, what other legal roles are involved? Like in the non-autonomous vehicle systems, you may have like a, th like the distributor may have had some role in doing something or yeah. a prior owner and you have all these other roles. Uh, are there any other roles that you've identified in open loop autonomous vehicle systems that could relate to parties in a litigation over a tort? Yeah, so uh, so the, the term manufacturer is changing a lot. Uh, so a good example of this is Waymo. They buy cars from Chrysler. They buy minivans from Chrysler. Uh, they outfit them aftermarket with a software stack. Um, and sometimes people refer to Waymo as a manufacturer and other times they don't. But so manufacturer, when it's referred to in the tour context, often just refers to the last person that made an aftermarket modification uh, and then sold this product to a customer. Uh, and if the customer then goes on to make an aftermarket modification, that's going to sever the chain of liability. So that's, a, that's another uh, factor to, to put in here. But so in a world where uh, you're getting this sort of Uber style and you have no ability to make any aftermarket modification yourself to your own personal autonomous vehicle, um, then th the software developer is going to be the final person in this chain. Um, but the software developer will be in a contractual relationship with the auto manufacturer. Um, if the auto manufacturer has a defect in their actual vehicle and not the software itself, then the auto manufacturer will be able to tie them into a liability chain in the event of an accident. And if someone in the supply chain that led up to the creation of the uh, of the automobile has any particular defect in the componentry, then the same will be true of them. But so, yeah, so if you have a closed loop system, then the passenger is basically just not involved. Um, if you have an open loop system, then the person that could have intervened in the event of an accident uh, will be the one responsible for the vehicle. Last follow up, and then we're going to be the whole, this whole drill and the distributed autonomous organizations. So you've got the closed loop system, but yeah. meanwhile they have information feeds. So yes. now let's postulate a little bit that we have the merry pranksters that GPS navigation are us, and it's April 1st, unfortunately, 2022. Yeah. And they decide, oh, we're going to send everybody into the war zone uh, and the quarantine zone by CDC and the recent nuclear fallout Superfund site. Um, and then... Uh, and because obviously nobody's going to do that, ha ha. But wait, <laughs> there's a new creature on the roads that's not exercising human judgment, but that is operating according to inputs. Um, so now we have a, a deliberate action taken by a party that wasn't a manufacturer, and um, let's say a clever um, glib tort lawyer, <laughs> plaintiff's lawyer, uh, in a tort case, uh, makes the case that they were the proximate cause. Are they a defendant? And if so, what would their role be in this whole system? Yeah. Uh, so again, this would look uh, this would look very similar to what it would look like today. Uh, your car is governed. Most modern cars are now governed by enough software that hackers could intervene in the system, close the loop away from you again as a passenger or driver, um, and get your vehicle into um, potentially tortious conduct. Um, so if uh, if you can show that someone hacked into a vehicle. Um, then uh, the manufacturer may be on the hook for cybersecurity concerns. Uh, there are very complex uh, and labyrinthine uh, legal standards in that realm, um, but it'll be a question over uh, cybersecurity measures for the manufacturer and not a question over uh, driver responsibility for the person who happens to be sitting in the driver's seat. Beautiful. Can I, can I add a question? Yes, please. In fact, now it's, it's um, prima verde. You can ask questions and you can open. Because I was discussing with uh, one other fellow from the Berkman Center, and she was uh, she's working on adversarial um, AI, and uh, she was actually explaining how uh, you don't actually need to hack into so hacking into the system is obviously like um, um, a criminal activity, but you can actually like with like salt or uh, like you can create shapes on the on the road and then the autonomous system is not properly developed will actually get fooled and think that it needs to turn because there is salt that is in a shape of turning yeah. and then create an accident. So in that case, I'm not really, there is no like trespassing, there is no like actually hacking into a system. I'm just putting 
salt on the ground, which it by itself is a legitimate uh, uh, activity. <laughs> <laughs> so how how will that uh, enter into like the tax uh, liability thing? Yeah, so again, the first thing I always ask myself in this context is like, what would it look like if it happened today with normal automobiles? And if there's nothing really different, then I tend to just default to what would happen today with normal automobiles. So if someone disables a stoplight, if a prankster disables a stoplight and someone doesn't see it in the middle of the night and runs through an intersection and then gets into a collision, uh, it would look very similar to someone uh, graffitiing a stop sign in an adversarial way that they know is going to prevent an autonomous vehicle from uh, uh, observing a stop sign. So there will then be two questions. One will be, did the manufacturer take sufficient measures to avoid these kind of adversarial attacks? Was their system sufficiently robust that it can tell the difference between these subtleties that often... Um, these kind of subtle artifacts that we know can break otherwise really high-performing deep neural networks. Um, it's a major reason why people aren't putting these things out in the field uh, yet. Uh, it, you can be incredibly high-performing uh, in a vision recognition task. Someone can just like change a few pixels um, in a way that a human uh, eye would never detect, and it can it can completely fool the system. Uh, that's a major problem. That's I think what you just described is a more sophisticated version of that. Uh, something that would approach um, a a spoofing attack that could also fuel, fool humans. Um, but again, if, uh, if if pranksters are involved uh, and the manufacturer has taken sufficient measures to guard against it. Um, then the liability question will probably uh, go away from the manufacturers and, and toward the pranksters. Um, so can you explain, can you sort of run us through this, this general kind of um, scene setting and analysis of your evaluation in the distributed autonomous entity um, context? Because it's, it's, a, it's a bit different from vehicles. It's quite different. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of the actors that are involved, um, so there is obviously the developer of the of the software that is running this autonomous system. Uh, secondly, you have, and the developer is usually, can be one person or can be like a large community of open source developers, um, which can also be anonymous. Secondly, you have the deployer of those systems, so the person that takes the software and put it, um, deploy it on the blockchain, again, which can be a completely anonymous person, or pseudonymous at least. Um, then we have the users that are willingly interacting with that system uh, for achieving a particular purpose. Then we have, um, so depending on how the system is designed, but most of the time that system rel needs to rely on some kind of external information. And so you have the oracles, um, which are third parties that will provide a particular set of information that is necessary for the execution of, um, of the software. And so they also have a power to influence the behavior of these systems. Um, and then finally, you have this very new category uh, of actors, which are all those actors that are participating to maintaining the underlying blockchain network, which makes it possible for those transactions to go through and therefore for the system to actually execute. Um, so that's kind of like the mapping of all the possible actors involved in, in such a system. Great. So I'm just going to repeat it and tell me if I've, if I've got it. Yeah. Um, you've got the you know, basically the, the, the developers of the code. Yeah. You have the deployer, the whoever actually executes the transaction to um, put it on a blockchain so it can operate. You have the users, the people that would be transacting or interacting through it. Uh, you've got the, um, an oracle or the, the um, external um, source of data that it's maybe drawing from, whether it's like a market mark or whatever, a calendar. And then you've got the um, maintainers of the code base. Yeah. Or, well, maintainers, but also, in a sense, in, in at least financials, in like payment systems and supply chains, we would sometimes call it the system provider that's maintaining and upgrading and whatever, keeping the lights on overall. So right. are those the kind of general categories? I think that's a very, yeah, that's a general overview of the 
possible people that could be considered liable or not. Beautiful. Um, now, I think the interesting aspect with the blockchain is that because everything is traceable, everything is recorded on the blockchain, it's actually quite simple to follow the chain of causality and to understand what is it that caused a particular event from happening. Very simple. So as opposed to an AI-based system, a, a decision, as opposed to the system characterized by decisional autonomy, where there is this kind of like uh, legal vacuum as, as to who should be held responsible for various action, in the case of a distributed blockchain, autonomous blockchain-based system, I feel like the, it's actually imputing responsibility is easy. The problem is that we actually don't know who are the people behind, in the sense that we don't know who is the manufacturer. We, we, we don't know who developed the code. We don't know who deployed the code. Uh, the users could also be pseudonymous. Uh, the oracles depending on the case, can be or cannot be pseudonymous. And then the miners is not just like one service provider, it's a distributed network of actors that are all around the world. And so, and so just as a, as a helpful public service announcement, the two words you said in the recitation were in some parties are maybe anonymous and some may be pseudonymous, and you just were mentioning pseudonymous. So yeah. is that, that's what you're sort of talking about, is we don't have necessarily know the identity of a party behind a blockchain address that could be unknown? Yes. Okay, so great. So it's, it's not straightforward to identify who is the person behind the, the identity. And, uh, and so I think when we talk about blockchain-based system and the autonomy related to that, the legal challenge that it raises is not about imputing liability, finding who could be held responsible, is actually at the level of the enforcement. So there is an enforcement gap in the sense that one we don't really, we know who, I, who is the party that has interacted on the blockchain and that that caused a particular action that might lead to, to some kind of tort or criminal activity, but we cannot really trace back who that person is. And even if we could, that doesn't really help much because once the system has been deployed, then if money is moved from one, one, one smart contract to the other smart contract, we actually cannot intervene in order to remediate. So. The, um, so the enforcement of tort law becomes extremely complex um, because of the operational autonomy of those systems. So on the one hand, once they have been deployed, there is no possibility of controlling or influencing their execution. So even if we find the developer, we can hold the developer to be liable, but yet it's not going to change anything from the way in which that system operates. And secondly, we cannot actually recover those, the damages, because unless there is this kind of coordinated action, and that's where the oracles and the miners become important, because they might not necessarily be liable to begin with in terms of the deployment and the execution of the software, but they are the only ones that actually have some kind of distributed control over the way in which the, the, the system can operate, and therefore, and there is like some, a lot of discussion that is going on now about like whether developers, for instance, have fiduciary duties on the, on the outcome of the execution of the software, whether miners could also be held to be some, to some extent responsible because they are the one that are making it possible for this particular piece of software to execute. Right? So we are to some extent, by, because it's impossible to affect the system itself, and because it's very hard to identify the people responsible to begin with, then there is those arguments that are being raised about, well, let's look at who are the people that we actually can identify and that we can actually exert pressure on, and perhaps those should be the person that are liable because they have control over it. They didn't participate in the initial development and deployment, but they are the one that can influence the outcome of the execution. Beautiful, thank you, that was very clarifying. Um, so just to see if I absorbed that last point um, and, and maybe to help translate perhaps a little, um, even if today um, miners do not have as part of their ordinary um, set of activities taking any I don't know, like role of investigating the implications of what they're mining beyond proof of stake 
or whatever is necessary to get their um, to get their payment. Perhaps going forward, since the miners of transactions being entered onto blocks on blockchains are in a position to in, to um, to take an action that could that could prevent a harm, maybe there ought to be a legal framework developed to impose that duty and then they might take actions as a group, for example, to inspect the um, legal implications or the or the tort implications of, of the transactions as well as doing the, the sort of proof of stake work and maybe that might be reflected in the, in the gas price or the transaction fee, but at least going forward, we now systemically have a way where there'd be some party taking some action to avoid avoidable harms. Is that the general idea? I mean, so that's not the general, because there's no general idea. <laughs> that's one, one, some ideas that are being suggested, which of course are also highly problematic because if we actually take the, the analogy with the internet, these miners are actually just like transaction processors. They are like um, routers. They are just like, those are intermediary. They are not, they, you cannot ask miners to verify and to monitor every possible uh, implication of every transaction they are processing. So it's kind of as when like the, the DMCA and whatever is like, to which extent can we actually ask a mere conduit to be responsible for every single packet that they are actually passing? So asking miners to become responsible for uh, and potentially liable for the, the execution of the software that they are actually enabling is, is also problematic in that sense because that means that by definition, no transaction will be processed unless it is whitelisted and then the permissionlessness uh, of the blockchain is just reduced to a, to a very large extent. So it is, yes, it is a solution, but we need to also take into account the collateral effect and the implication of such a solution. Indeed, thank you. Um, yeah, that, and so this raises another question I think I'd like to pose to both, both of you, which is the, um, <laughs> Uh, let's call it an, the, the potential of an accountability gap, an accountability gap with the introduction of autonomous systems that may be causing you know, contract, or tort, or criminal um, liability w when it's hard to identify the, um, where, where, where it's important to have a human that's a legal entity identified that who could be a party later. Um, I was... Um, doing a little research for the panel and, and for other projects, I've seen that there's a kind of a, a, a trend happening um, with a suggestion for AI generally, but specifically for autonomous systems to ensure that there is a like human being or group of humans w w that are identified like with contact information um, who would bear responsibility um, for the conduct, if you will, or operation and consequences of autonomous systems. Um, have either of you heard this um, sort of refrain? And if so, how might it play out? So for example, in the autonomous vehicle context, might we see a new kind of role for insurers um, or other parties that are like connected to a license plate or something like that where you could where anybody out there interacting in the wild with the autonomous system has a means and a mechanism by which they could identify a party um, and begin to process um, an adjudication. And similarly, uh, or analogously or something, uh, in, the in the DAO um, context, what if there was a, um, I don't know, in the future like a consumer protection or a financial regulation type of rule where <clears throat> Um, uh, where the parties that right now can, can by design, be a, anonymous or pseudonymous. Instead, uh, um, there was some way to bring them back in when there's been a harm that has been caused um, by way of uh, being able to attribute. In, in, in other parts of payment systems, this all looks like know your customer on uh, that sort of stuff. But what about the possibility of having a human who had to whom the acts of the autonomous system can be attributed 
um, and, um, and a mechanism to identify them and to, and to find them and contact them in the, if there's a need to do a service of process later. How does that play out in each of your contexts? Yeah, my, mine's the shortest one, I think. I, I don't think it'll be a huge problem to find who is responsible for an autonomous vehicle accident if it, there is actually an autonomous vehicle involved, except maybe in a world where people own personal autonomous vehicles and are making aftermarket modifications or, or something like that. But I think it's much more of a concern in the distributed autonomous context. Um, uh, just because of the nature of robotic systems that require uh, cutting edge software, uh, it's just, I, I don't think it's gonna be a huge problem at this point, um, but, uh, but I do think uh, in the pseudonymous uh, uh, digital environments that uh, are governing these de decentralized systems, it's definitely an, an interesting question. Um, yeah, so I think I have to answer to, to different topics to answer that. Uh, one is with regard to um, um, identification. Why will people identify themselves if I don't have to, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, so there is this, uh, there is increasingly jurisdictions that are actually uh, proposing to provide some kind of um, recognition to DAO, some kind of legal recognition, legal Malta. personality, Malta, Vermont, and so forth. And uh, the criteria for that is, of course, that you need to register your DAO. And uh, by registering your DAO, you need to identify yourself. There needs to be like people responsible and so forth. And, and more than that, uh, basically, the, the condition for obtaining this, um, this legal recognition is that the DAO also complies with specific uh, technological constraints. And so in that way, it's actually quite and it's, like, it's quite an interesting uh, approach in the sense that, of course, people can still create their own DAOs without any kind of identification or, uh, or compliance with any kind of uh, constraints. However, they will not benefit from this kind of legal recognition that will give, to some extent, some form of legal capacity to this DAO, which means that the DAO is not just this technological system, but can actually enter into a real contractual relationship, potentially can own real assets and so forth. So basically it's kind of like a, it's an incentive. It's like, do you want to give this autonomous system an actual legal recognition under full legal capacity? Then you need to identify yourself and fulfill those constraints. If not, no one can force you to do it, but then you don't get those benefits. So that's one, one side of the question. Um, the other side with, with regard to insurance, um, it's actually, so it's a problem, of course, because who do you insure? Like, who, who is gonna pay for any damages? But uh, there is this, um, this question is about auditing contracts, so certifications, right? And uh, basically, today you have a lot of people that are constantly auditing those, this software because if there is any problem in the software, it cannot change anymore. So there is a big business that is coming around about providing very thorough audits in order to ensure that they actually operate as claimed. So and so-called formal verification. Yeah, in, in, part, in, in part. And um, and then the question is like, well, actually, those that are actually providing the certification should also be those that are actually providing the insurance for the fact that they operate as plain. Because today, the problem is that you have like auditors and certificators that don't really have any, like except reputational damages, but they don't have any economic damage for the fact that actually the, the software didn't work as they planned because it was unforeseeable. So the question then becomes, can we actually create those, those unify those two um, functions, which is one, the auditing and certification function to claim that the software has been written in a particular manner and will act in that manner. And then an insurance scheme associated with that so that if they fail in their audits, then they have to pay the, the, whoever has been damaged from that, right? And in that sense, you can create system that, of course, again, we cannot force any, anything to be certified, but users that want to interact with the system will most likely be more likely to interact with the one that have been certified because they know that there is a potential compensation that will come through an insurance scheme if that particular system was to cause damages to them. Thank you. And this system, by the way, and I will be curious what you think, 
potentially I, I, I can see how the same model could be applied also to autonomous uh, vehicles and so forth, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I have a lot of thoughts on insurance in this context, um, and uh, it's a it's a deep, deep rabbit hole. Um, but uh, but yeah, I do I do think so. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so um, just to highlight a couple of facets of what was just said in a tort context, um, we're looking at measures to allocate um, um, the risk of loss uh, and. Um, Damages, but also to well cap damages in a way, and so um, you know the idea of uh, having a corporation, uh, and so in the context in particular of DAOs, um, being able to register as like a corporation or LLC your your DAO, which uh, Primavera was just talking about, in, in addition to the um, ability for it to now enforce a contract and own property, of course. If we all learn in first year of law school, it also gives you liability limitation is one of the benefits that could be attractive for people to voluntarily use. And then um, you can shift uh, responsibility by now having an entity that could have insurance. And there may be new roles. We have well-worn roles for insurance in automotion, auto, automobiles. Uh, there may be new roles between the certifiers and uh, insurers and, and bonding and so forth for DAOs. So, um, so with that, I'd like to um, open it up um, to see if uh, who has questions or ideas they'd like to share uh, in the audience. And looks like we've got one from our a legal hacker who's made the journey um, from Kansas City, if I'm not mistaken, and now at MIT. What's your question? You're you're a little bit involved in the question too, but uh, yeah. So you're. Everybody here is uh, pretty smart and kind of leading us into this future and confluence of cyberspace and real space. So I'm wondering if you had to create an entirely new class of torts that's specific to digital space, what would it be and why? Discuss. <laughs> Um, yeah, so again, going back to what, with all the caveats that I, that I set out before about economic loss doctrine, uh, especially in the digital space, uh, I would make a tort for bias. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of issues in this area uh, and a lot of challenging tort questions about severing liability um, for systems whose bias results in harms. So, um, so if your system uh, is very good at diagnosing ailments, uh, but you've trained it on uh, a population that isn't representative of the whole, uh, and there's a slight bias that is having very, very tiny statistical impacts, but very, very real ones when deployed at scale, uh, it is not at all clear how the tort system is going to deal with that. It is very, very poorly at the statistical level, very, very well at the individual level. Uh, and machine learning systems are sort of, by definition, tearing the individual into a statistical question. Um, and especially because of economic loss doctrine and a lack of transparency into these systems, you're going to have this situation where we know there will be biased systems out in the world. Um, contract law isn't going to do a great job of it. Um, legal accountability, sort of proactive policy measures are probably not going to do a great uh, job of it. And the common law has historically filled this gap. Uh, and we're going to have real challenges around bias because of that statistical versus individual distinction. Yeah, I, I think in the blockchain space, it's not more, it's not really a question of what new torts can we create. I think, like again, the, the, the real problem is not that we cannot apply tort law. It's just that we cannot enforce tort law. Beautiful. Um, and I'm not sure how I was involved in that. I've committed no torts. <laughs> um, but, um, but I have a thought, at least, uh, which is, and it kind of, actually, I first thought of it when you were speaking, Primavera, about like the main remedy um, would be to reverse the transaction, and yet that's exactly what we can't do with these uh, immutable systems. But you know, there is another kind of remedy when you can lay your hands on, and when you can attribute the act of the autonomous system to a legal party like a human, um, if you could unwind it or do forensics to find out who the transacting parties were, for example, or to identify the um, the maintainers of the system that were responsible for the most recent patch that was that caused the issue, which is um, 
a uh, other kind of equitable remedy uh, in a tort context. Um, so you could imagine equitable remedies to, I don't know, everything from forcing an apology to um, you know providing you know like no transaction fees for a year going forward, not backward, right up to in theory, like the big hammer of you know you must. Um, fork the blockchain, um, like in the DAO hub context. But you know, equitable remedies could be another innovative way to apply traditional tort law in this new context, maybe? So actually, yes. And I think that's, uh, that, that's also very dangerous. Um, like, actually, I would rather advocate for, it is, of course, possible to add possibly new tort or, uh, you know, like, for instance, holding the developer uh, to be fiduciaries, uh, the miners to be responsible. And it is, of course, possible to add those new thoughts on those actors in order to ensure that they're going to help enforce rules. But um, it, it's, it's kind of like all the, like, it's, it, it replicates a little bit the same story as copyright in which we're trying to address a small problem and the solution to this small problem become a much larger problem. Um, so I will be very worried actually that by adding those new thoughts, which might be because of a very good intention that we want to, uh, to compensate people or to limit the possible damages, then we're actually to some extent disrupting the whole infrastructure of a blockchain-based system because all of a sudden everyone is potentially liable and then the system does not operate anymore, right? Indeed. Um, and that's, a, oh, I just said, that's a very common theme. In, oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. The, that's also a very common theme in the autonomous vehicles context. Most people think that we should solve many of these very complex liability issues by just putting all of the liability on manufacturers and there are very real um, economic implications for that, including ones that implicate the manufacturer's ability to deploy the technology, which could be life-saving. Right, so we want a well-functioning market, not a market destroyed by regulation. Finding that balance is the challenge. Uh, we have another question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a great segue to my question, actually, and thank you for the panel. So I wanted to ask about limited liability today in, uh, in distributed organizations. Um, you spoke a bit about the possibility of potentially registering a DAO so that it obtains limited liability through as a corporation or LLC. But my question is, how would this work today? And it seems like since not registered, there would be classed as general partnerships. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I understand correctly, that would mean that any potentially any token holder could be liable for the entire damage of the, uh, the DAO that it does. Is this a risk today, or how would the uh, legislature or the judiciary look at it, do you think? Sounds like a question. <laughs> yeah, so I would say it, it, um, it depends how the DAO is operated. So if you just have like a highly automated system, uh, like um, like a automated like a smart contract that is dealing with like lotteries or gambling, uh, probably is is actually just like a piece of code and people are interacting with it. So the user that interact with it, if they are if they are, if it's illegal to to gamble in that particular jurisdiction, they might be liable, but um, you couldn't claim that this whole operation is a general partnership, as opposed to specific DAOs in which the operation of the DAO require uh, voting or administration by a series of token holder or reputation holder or whatever it is. In that case, it's quite likely that it's gonna qualify as a general partnership and then indeed everyone is jointly liable. And this is one of the reasons why there is a lot of uh, um, discussion today as to how, whether we actually need to provide this kind of, uh, like, do, do, do we need to register them? And there is increasingly uh, more and more people that actually want to register the DAO, even though it's very, very different from the initial ideas, which was we want a DAO because we want to operate outside of the legal system. But because of the risk of joint liability, indeed more and more people are actually moving towards that route. And this is, a, this is definitely a, a problem and, and a potential liability. Beautiful. And then just to, again, amplify something you sort of hinted at earlier, um, for those that want to Google, um, look at Vermont and what's known as the BBLLC, which Prima Vera mentioned, blockchain-based LLC. That's a new statute uh, that was enacted within the last year or so. There's already, uh, you can then go to law.mit.edu and um, look at the blog, and we interviewed some developers that have created uh, the DORG, distributed org, and, reg and um, 
and incorporated it and gave it legal um, personality in Vermont by registering it as an LLC. Look forward looking to Malta um, is going to be developing even better ways um, to um, allow incorporation of DAOs. So there's a lot going on in that space. Unfortunately, it looks like that's all we have time for, although we've just scratched the surface of this. But I really want to thank uh, Brian and Prima Farah for, um, for enlightening us all on this topic. And I encourage you all to, to keep the dialogue going. This is really just the beginning in the area of law uh, of the implications of autonomous systems. So um, stick with it. And, um, and let, please let uh, Robert Mahari know um, your questions going forward. And uh, we're, we're well connected uh, between MIT and Harvard, at least. And perhaps we can continue the dialogue. So thank you very much for your attention and your questions. This concludes our panel. Thank you.